Father, thank you so much that as we start out this session together, living life backwards based on the book of Ecclesiastes. Lord, we thank you that you have made this study available to us. You're the one that revealed that this is the direction that we need to go. So much so that it, our men are in this study. Our young adults are in this study. It is a shift in how we see our lives and how we live our everyday life for the glory of your name. Lord, my prayer is as we start out this night tonight, that you would open our ears to hear what the Spirit of the Lord wants to speak to us. Give us eyes to see what we need to see, Lord. Work in our heart. Work within us, Lord, so that fruit may come forth and so that we can release what needs to be released so that we can stop striving and struggling and so that we can live in the joy of the Lord, the strength of the Lord. Lord, tonight I pray you make my tongue the pen of a ready writer. Lord, let the words that need to be spoken be spoken in this room. Bless our men as they gather and study the word, as they discuss how it pertains to them, how to live life backwards. Do a work in us as believers. And then our young people as they study the book of Daniel, how wonderful for them to understand how to stand in this time against the culture. So God, we just commit this time to you. We breathe in and just let go of whatever the day might have been like, whatever the stresses might have been. Those who are on Zoom, that are, that are joining us, Lord, whatever the stresses may have been, whatever the weight might have been, whatever we might have experienced today, we just right now release it and just tell you in this moment, we wanna be connected to what you're doing and what you're speaking. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you have your Bibles, of course, have your Bibles open to Ecclesiastes. Hope you have something that perhaps you can take some notes as well. Um, and we're going to start at Ecclesiastes chapter one. Let me know when you're there. Ecclesiastes chapter one. You're going to get real familiar with this book if you've never read it. Um, you're going to get real familiar with it. What I will ask if you're coming in late, if you would just pause and those big signs that say have a seat right here in this area, if you just have a seat in that area and then as soon as the message is over, you can go to your table time. It'll just kind of help us keep things together. All right, Ecclesiastes chapter one, let's read that together. Let's read that. The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. First of all, there is an establishment of who is speaking. It says, the words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What profit has a man from all his labor in which he toils where? Under the sun. One generation passes away and another generation comes, but the earth abides forever. The sun also rises and the sun goes down and hastens to the place where it arose. The wind goes towards the south and turns around to the north. The wind whirls about continually and comes again on its circuit. All the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full to the place from which the rivers come. There they return again. All things are full of labor. Man cannot express it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. That which has been is what will be. That which is done is what will be done. And there is nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which it may be said, see, this is new? It has already been in ancient times before. There is no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of things that are to come by those who will come after I, the preacher, was king over Israel in Jerusalem, and I set my heart to seek and search out by wisdom concerning all that is done under heaven. This burdensome task God has given to the sons of man, by which they may be exercised. I have seen all the works that are done under the sun, and indeed, all is vanity and grasping for the wind." What is crooked cannot be made straight, and what is lacking cannot be numbered. I commune with my heart, saying, look, I have attained greatness and have gained more wisdom than all who were before me in Jerusalem. My heart 
has understood great wisdom and knowledge, and I set my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. I perceive that this also is grasping for the wind. For in much wisdom is much grief, and he who increases knowledge increases sorrow. Ecclesiastes chapter one. Let's get this intro night going together. There's two points that we will make tonight, and the first one is why Ecclesiastes? That is going to be one of our point. Why Ecclesiastes? And the next point that we will dig in together is the perspective of the believer. What is the believer's perspective in this journey? Perhaps you're wondering what this journey is all about. Chapter one of Ecclesiastes opens up with the preacher saying, vanity of vanities. The writer of our book opens up stating, the writing of our, our book that we're reading, he opens up stating the very fact that he is going to die. And by the time you read the book, he might already be dead. It seems like we started off this journey, and you're like, what is this really all about? It starts off kind of, 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 kind of dreary to where the, the preacher says, vanity of vanity, all is vanity. And then the writer of this book says, I'm going to die, and by the time you read it, I might already be dead. What is this study really about? Well, this study is going to teach us in View of the fact that we all are going to die, it is going to teach us how we really need to start living and how we live backwards with the understanding of our eternity. We grew up, I would hear it oftentimes in the real South where I grew up in Tennessee, they would have this saying, they would say, everyone has a reservation at a cemetery without the privilege of cancellation. Anybody ever heard that before? Everyone has a reservation at a cemetery without the privilege of cancellation. That is the one thing you and I cannot cancel. We can cancel a whole lot of appointments, but our exit out of here, we cannot cancel. We are going to leave this earth because this is not the place of our final resting place. This is not our home. As a matter of fact, when I was pondering that and that saying came to me, I began to think about with this whole study of Ecclesiastes and how the writer says he may already be dead, he's going to die, and how Solomon opens up with vanity of vanities. And I, I began to think about this whole thing of death and how we approach death and our view of death and our view of life. And then there's kind of like this tension between the two. And I, I began to think about how we're trained in ministry for when we have to eulogize to speak well of, of someone's loved one at a, at a funeral. We are trained particularly that we are not only speaking of the person that has passed on, we're speaking to the living that's in the room. We're speaking to the living that's in the room to encourage them to press on with life and how to live life in view of the sorrow and the grief that they are experiencing. When we are trained to that, there is this, this, this tension that is happening where there's grief in the room, but also there is this speaking of how one can still press on and live life and experience the joy of life in the absence of someone that they love. And as I was pondering that and thinking of that, I couldn't help but in this intro kind of set a, a stage for us to move around on and to build upon as I thought about with this eulogy, speaking well and what we do at funeral services of a story that my husband shares every time, 99.9% .9 of the time when he is doing a eulogy at a service. He tells this, and this relates to our lesson tonight, of when he went to California to be with his friend whose son had been trying tragically killed by a drunk driver. He flew into Ontario, California. And after the services were over, it was time for his departure to go head back home. And at that particular time, we were living in Nashville. It was time for him to fly back home. His ride dropped him back off at the airport in Ontario, in Ontario, California. As he was standing there at the uh, ticketing desk, the agent looked up at him and said, sir, you are at the wrong airport. Your flight, your exit, your departure flight is actually at LAX. He proceeded to say back to her, knowing he had been dropped off at Ontario. He began to proceed to talk back to her and say, no ma'am, I'm flying back home from Ontario. She said, no sir, 
you are, need to get to LAX to catch your flight. He began to try and tell her, well, let me speak to your supervisor, please, as if the supervisor is going to do some kind of navigation with him to change his ticket to where he can fly to Ontario. The supervisor comes to the counter and says, sir, how can I help you? He proceeds to tell her the situation. She looks at him and says, sir, your flight leaves from LAX. Yes, you flew here to Ontario, but your flight, your departure flight, is at LAX, and the longer you stand here <laughs> to try to convince us to change your ticket, that we did something with your itinerary, you're going to miss that flight as well. I would suggest you stop talking to us and get you a ride to LAX, because in this traffic, it's gonna take you about four hours to get there. And then she looked at him and she said these words that he said are forever seared in his mind. It is not our fault you didn't read your itinerary. What does that have to do with us tonight? A lot, because it is not anyone's fault we don't read our itinerary. This is our itinerary. We know that we're not staying here. We know that this is not our home, that as the songs that we have sang, we are pilgrims on a journey. I just have to start by asking us, are we reading the itinerary? Are we living like this is our forever home? Are we trying to live like we're never going to leave this place? Ecclesiastes is gonna challenge us, knowing that this is not our home, that we have eternity. There is a way for us to live here, knowing our itinerary and our destination. John chapter 14, verse two, Two and three makes it very clear what this means to us that this is not our home. Jesus said to his disciples in John chapter 14, if you want to turn there, about this itinerary, this place that you and I are going. He makes it very clear to them what is going to take place with them. Open up your Bible. I want you to look at that. John. He speaks of what they will experience. John chapter 14, verse 2. He says this to them, in my father's house are many mansions, which means rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to do what? Prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. This is not our home. Part of our itinerary is to exit. And we're gonna learn there's nothing to fear with death. We have an eternal home, but how are we living right now? So let's go to point number one. Why Ecclesiastes? Romans chapter 15. And you can write this verse down. Romans chapter 15, verse four. Here's one reason why. It says, for whatever things were written before were written for our learning that through the patience and comfort of the scriptures, we might have hope. It's written for our learning, that as we study Ecclesiastes, perhaps some of you are saying, I've never really read Ecclesiastes. No, it was there, never really read it. And when I opened it up, the minute it started saying vanity of vanities, I didn't want to read it anymore. <laughs> but Solomon is gonna help us understand something tonight. Solomon is going to teach us, and it's very clear in verse 1 where it says, the words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem, that this is Solomon, though you do not read his name. It is him. He is the son of the king of Jerusalem. So what Solomon does, before I give a little history on him, what Solomon does is this Hebrew word that's called kohelet. Kohelet. Kohelet means this. It is the assembler. And so what Solomon does, he is the Kohelet. He assembles us together. He calls an assembly because he wants to give us some information. He wants to give us some news. He wants to tell us what God said. He wants to speak to us about life. And he writes Ecclesiastes, theologians say, right around 50 years old, where he has gone through some things, he has looked back on some things, and he has examined some things. And so as we read this, this is, is an opportunity for us to make some changes and adjustments in our life. Solomon said, let me tell you, have you ever had someone that's gone through something 
And some of us older people try and talk to young, younger people and tell them, I'm trying to tell you this. So you don't have to go through it. But we're looking at them and they don't want to hear what we have to say. And we know we're telling them the truth and they need to heed to our wisdom because we walk through it and we're saying, what I experience, you don't have to experience. Anybody with me? And they don't pay attention. Your heart just breaks because you know their head is going to hit up against a brick. Solomon said, let me help you by, not, by stopping your head from hitting up against a brick. Let me tell you some truth that can change the way you live life. Listen to what Solomon tells us, and then let's look at a little bit of Solomon's life. Go to 1 Kings chapter 2. Stay with me. It gets good. 1 Kings chapter 2 gives us a little bit of history. Look at 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 1. It says, now the days of David drew near that he should, what? David's getting ready to die. 1 Kings 2, we're at verse 1. David is getting ready to die and he charged Solomon his son saying, I go the way of all the earth. Be strong therefore and prove yourself a man and keep the charge of the Lord your God to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes and his commandments, his judgments and his testimonies as it is written in the law of Moses that you may prosper in all that you do and wherever you turn King David gives Solomon some advice. Keep the way of the Lord so that you can prosper in all that he says and do. Follow his commands. Walk true to his statutes. But I want you to see something because Solomon is also speaking from a place of, I did not heed wisdom. Though known as the wisest man who ever lived, Solomon did not heed wisdom. Turn over to chapter 4. Unless I want you to turn to verse 29. It first starts off in, in, in chapter 4. It says, so Solomon was king over all of Israel. But I want us to see some of the things that he had. Well, go to verse 22. Just look at this. Solomon's provision for one day was 30 cords of fine flour, 60 cords of meal, 10 and fat, fattened calves, 20 oxen from the pastures, and 100 sheep besides deer, gazelles, roebucks, and fatted. Foul. Solomon had dominion over all the region on the side of the river of Tispa. Wait a minute. Doesn't it sound like Solomon has a lot, right? Solomon has a lot. It, it, it gets more. Turn over. Now look at verse 29. It says, and God gave Solomon wisdom and exceedingly great understanding and largeness of heart like the sand on the seashore. Thus Solomon's wisdom excelled the wisdom of all the men of the East and all the wisdom of the Egypt. For he was wiser than all men, than Ethan, the Ezraite, Heman, Kakal, and Darda, and the sons of Maal. And his fame was in all the surrounding nations. Wait a minute. Solomon says, I know something about fame. All the nations have heard of Solomon. He knows something about fame and he's got wealth. He says this, he spoke 3,000 in verse 32. He spoke 3,000 proverbs and his songs were 1,005. He also spoke of trees from the cedar tree of Lebanon even to the hyssop that springs out of the wall. He spoke also of animals, of birds, of creeping things and of fish and men of all the nations from all the kings of the earth who had heard of his wisdom came to hear the wisdom of Solomon. Wait a minute, get that. Pause for a minute. People from, men from all over are coming to hear the wisdom of Solomon. Back, back even to verse 26. He had 40,000 stalls of horses for his chariots and 12,000 horsemen. We're not going to get even, you go out in, in, in 1 Kings 11, it says about all the concubines he had. He had so many women. Solomon had it all. And even then when you find in 1 Kings 11 with all of the women that he had, with all of these concubines, he said they were women from other nations that God had forbidden them to hook up with women from other nations, because intermarry with people from other nations. Not anything to do with race. Anybody teach you that? That is bad theology. Not true. It is because they were into other gods. And the other gods would lead them astray. Solomon did it anyway. 
So we see with all of his fame, with all of his fortune, with everybody knowing him, Solomon goes back in, in, in verse one and he says, vanity of vanities is just all vanity. He's going to tell us why. One writer says, Eden says this, what then is the purpose of Ecclesiastes? It is an essay in apologetic. It defends the life of faith and a generous God by pointing to the grimness of the alternative. Here's the fact. Solomon gets down to this. You can have it all, but a life outside of God is vanity of vanities. You can have it all, but without God, there is no enjoyment. There is no joy in it. You can have fame. You can have fortune. You can amass wealth. But a life apart from God, it is vanity. It is meaningless. And if the other thing Solomon tells us is that it's like a breath. It is fleeting. It does not last. The new doesn't stay new. You got that new iPhone, and after you got that new phone or that new Verizon, whatever your phone is, they came out with another one that they told you was better, that it had a better camera camera, that it operated better, that it had more apps, and you got excited and went and stood in that long line to trade out that phone. They know how to keep giving us new things. We had a fit for that new dress, for that new skirt, for that new pair of shoes. And my God, by the time you got that one, you saw another one that was cuter and then you wanted another. It doesn't satisfy. Come on, y'all. Don't get quiet. You see something else that looks a little bit better. You get that new car. And it's got the new car smell, and no one can eat in it. <laughs> Don't drink in it. But the minute that new car smell starts to wear off, you're finding old french fries and cookies and it's loaded up like it's a closet. Your trunk is loaded and it is junky. You don't even care if it gets washed anymore because it's not new. Come on, am I telling the truth? You might be sitting here saying, you know what? But I don't live a life apart from God. Look, you can, we can be saved. You can show up at church all the time. Love, you, can, you can hear me clearly. Saved, coming to church, serving, and still be living apart from God. Here's how. How? Not living in alignment with his decrees, with his ways. I want to say it again. Solomon was king. Solomon was God's man, but he was living apart from God's ways. He was making his own choices. He was making his own decisions. He was amassing wealth. He was wise, but he was living apart from staying to what David had told him as a father. You stick to the decrees and the laws of God. You do what God says do because he is the one to prosper you. He did not heed. Those things just do not satisfy. Here's something else I want to read to you. It is one of the, Ecclesiastes is one of the most unusual books and perhaps it's going to be difficult for us to understand. It feels like it's hopeless, like it's full of despair. Yet the words of this preacher teaches us the futility and the foolishness of a life lived without an eternal perspective. What's your eternal perspective? Are we just waking up every day going through the motion? What's your eternal perspective? Because what he says is that when we have an eternal perspective, my decisions reflect that. Come on. An eternal perspective impacts the decisions I make. An eternal perspective impacts how I use my resources. For some of us, we're waking up and saying, I have not had an eternal perspective. The eternal perspective impacts my relationships. It changes the way I see everyday life. I began to see life knowing that life is a gift, that it is not promise. We do not know what tomorrow holds. And listen, ladies, as much as we may want to think we're in control, we're in control of absolutely nothing. Can I say that again? 
We are not in control. We talked about that this morning in, in our class of how we strive. Part of the striving is this, this feeling of a need to be in control as if we can manage something, as if we can make something happen and we don't have to. God is the one we need to trust and he is the one that is in control. Listen, Solomon isn't questioning God's existence. He knows that God exists. He knows that he is God and that God is always there. The question that Solomon is presenting before us is, what God, does God matter? How does God matter in the bigger equation. It's whether or not God matters in what we do. It's whether or not God matters in how we live our lives. Because the answer to the question is vitally connected to a responsibility to God that goes beyond the earthly life. See, when we start looking at our lives with the eternal perspective, it changes the way we even receive certain things that happen to us. There are certain things we're never going to know the answer to. There are certain things that are never, ever going to make sense to us. Anybody have some things that you just waiting to ask God? Then enough hands go up. Y'all go ahead and tell the truth. You know you waiting to ask God some stuff. <laughs> there are some things that are just never going to align. The eternal perspective puts me to understand the one who is just the one who is the judge, the one who knows everything. He sees the bigger picture. You and I live our lives just looking here. What Solomon has said, you need to lift up and get a worldview. You need to, to understand that all God is, is, it's like pulling a puzzle together. He's the one that's doing everything. He's the one that's navigating circumstances. And even what doesn't make sense, even the things that we don't have answer to, we can trust that God in the end will make it right, that God in the end will, te will show us, that God in the end will bring everything together for the glory of his name. That's what Solomon is telling us. He doesn't present a half dozen arguments to the existence of God, but he takes our questions. He takes our questions and he helps us to look at them. Can you cope with life without having any idea of where you're going? Knowing where we're going helps me cope with life. That's where Solomon is trying to, knowing where we're going helps us cope with adversity. Knowing where we're going helps us cope with defeat. Knowing where we're going helps us to cope when there's grief, when there is sorrow. Knowing where we're going helps us to embrace the joys that he gives us. You and I don't like to think about our own death. <laughs> Yet it is the most certain fact about our existence. Ecclesiastes shows the path in life that led that leads to emptiness and helps us to discover our purpose in life. I want to say that again. It helps us see the path in life that leads to emptiness, but it helps us to discover true purpose in life. So I want to stay here just for a minute. If you would, Philippians 1, 6. So we're going to talk about purpose just for a minute in this why Ecclesiastes. Y'all still with me? Y'all said we're talking about death? No, I'm, you already checked out. Come back, come back. It gets better. It gets better. I promise you it gets better. It gets better. Philippians 1, 6. What does it say to us? It speaks to us very clearly. Philippians 1, 6 tells us, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until when? The day of Jesus Christ. He's going, he will complete the good work that he started in us. That's part of the purpose. So I, I'm, I'm going to deal with this purpose just for a minute. Stay with me. Then Ephesians 2.10 says to us, for we are whose workmanship? We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for what kind of work? Good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Now, here I want to talk about this because why Ecclesiastes to lead us to this path of showing us the purpose in life, to not go for the emptiness, for the things that won't satisfy, 
to not live our lives pursuing things. He speaks to us very clearly. This is what he's trying to show us. I wanna talk about this because in Ephesians 2.10, it says we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works that he purposed beforehand that we should walk in them. Part of our striving, part of our tiredness, part of our straining for life, part of us not living in the moment, missing the joys of relationship, missing the joys of blessings right around us, being intentional in the moment, being satisfied with what we have is because we're pursuing things that perhaps he has not told us to pursue. Stay with me. I'm gonna challenge you right here. I said this this morning. We will tell and for those of you who have parents, so listen to me, and, and I told them this morning, don't send me an email, so don't. Um, God never told any of us that he had great things for us. Find the scripture. You won't. He didn't say, I have great things for you. What he says is, I have a purpose for you. Lean in. I'm going somewhere with it. You with me still? Great in comparison to what? What's the measuring rod? What's the measuring scale? It's the world system. It's culture. It's what we think is great. So we set ourselves up. Solomon said, look, I had fame. I had fortune. I'm the king. I had stars. Greatness. What, what is it that you consider great? Ask yourself that question. Because God didn't promise us greatness. So even when you want to take Jeremiah 29 and 11 and quote it, for I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Don't take it out of context. He's, taking, he's talking to the nation of Israel and they're in 70 years of captivity. You still with me? Y'all gonna stay the study? I gotta challenge you on that. He never told us that he had great things for us. What he said is that I have a purpose for you. Y'all with me? Now talk bad. Don't get stiff. Is this helping your theology? Because part of our theology, we played into a world system. Part of our theology is that we've sent ourselves striving. It's a challenge for some of us. We have to think about we're sending our children striving of everything we want them to be. We're going to live vicariously through them. I told you, don't send me an email. I know I don't have children, but I'm still telling you. Because it's a, Solomon is going opposite of some of the things that we have bought into. God says, I have a purpose for you. And part of that purpose is to be conformed. The number one is that you look like me. Come on, stay with me. Come on. Let's go straight scripture. That you... You live like me, that you are a disciple, that you follow me. Jesus didn't look rich. And not, there's nothing wrong with wealth, I'm going there. Nobody in here just saying, I'm going for broke. Oh, that ain't what I'm saying. <laughs> Before y'all run out of here, stick it through. I'm trying to challenge our thinking that what are we aligning ourselves to? What God did tell you is that you are my workmanship and I have good works for you. Do you trust that? I said, what do we compare to? What if in this that God, that some of us are suffering and God says, that's my plan for you. I'm getting the glory out of that. Don't shut down. What if it is that it, you, you are a missionary in China in some of the most dangerous parts of the world, what, what if that's just his plan? We have to watch what we are calling great and what we're saying, hey, this is, this is what God wants for me. God is saying what I want for you to bring yourself in alignment with me. What if, what if that child's purpose, that God has them work at McDonald's as a manager all his days. But God is getting the glory out of it because people are getting saved because of his leadership. You see how we have, we have put a label on what is successful and what is not. Are y'all with me? We put the label and it sends us in a different direction opposite 
many times of where God is trying to take us for his glory. This is a book, this, this, this study is gonna free us from the scramble for power because we live in a culture that says, get more, have more. You need to be powerful. Be powerful. It's, it sends us just striving for power, for approval, looking for approval, and for money. It doesn't teach us to draw close. The world doesn't teach us to draw closer to God. But Solomon is saying this, if you get closer to God, if you get close to him, listen to me, I messed up. I made some bad decisions, but if you get close to God, he is the one that can fully satisfy you. Apart from him, nothing that you get will satisfy you. And the world knows how to, sin, to, to, to go into our senses and how to get us excited about things to lure us off the path of God. It says in, in, in John, in 1 John, I believe it's 1 John or 2 John, it says, all that is in the world is the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. That's all that's in the world. And so the world, you and I have a battle of what, between what our itinerary says and what the world says. The world says, amass wealth for yourself. Get it all for yourself. The world says, get more, 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 more. And then I would ask you, are we ever satisfied? Solomon said, we're never satisfied. The eye is never satisfied. The ear is never satisfied. The world says, get more, get more, get more. And what we do is we find ourselves enslaved to more. Amen? Amen. Come on, talk back to me. It's, we, it, it's hitting all of us, honey. Let me tell you. <laughs> Let me tell you. <laughs> When you gather, you, you stand and you look at, the, you, you think about the things that have enslaved us. We can't, I, I'm going to talk about me and my more. I can, I, I, I've had this, I'll just testify. I had this shirt for like a year and hadn't worn it. But I just still want another shirt. It's another better looking jean shirt. We want more, more, more. I have to ask you a question. Is the more so that we can be generous and bless someone else? Or is the more for us? Come on, this, this study, I, it, it's just gonna, it's hitting home. Is the more for us? Or is because we're gonna learn as we study this, this isn't about me, this is about we. It's, it's a we thing in the kingdom. But the world tells you, look out for you. You get more for you, more money, more power. Do you find us being more generous? Let me ask you, with more, did more make you happier? Solomon says what it ends up doing, it enslaves us. And the world, again, knows how to send those messages to us. Think about the commercials that are on. And I'm almost, I'm going to my second point, but think about the commercials that are on. The commercials that we see. What does it, what does it say to us? Get more. Think about it. I, I told somebody, you, you, you go in restaurants, you're not even hungry, but you just become hungry because of the smell of food. We just want more. We see it. And he says that I is never satisfied. He goes back, vanities of vanities, apart from God, you will not be satisfied. Let me go to my second point, the believer's perspective. So Solomon is going to challenge us. What's, what's our, our perspective on this? What, what perspective? Let me ask you some questions before I, I read Mark chapter 8, and I want you to turn to Mark chapter 8, but what details are you choosing to ignore? Because we can play pretend, like little kids, pretend. But what details about your life are you choosing to ignore or pretending that they don't exist? As if acting like they're not there, you're going to circumvent experience in them. What is it that we're playing pretend with ourselves that we're trying to overlook? Is culture dictating your itinerary? Or is this Bible dictating, the itinerary that we have dictating how you live? Which one are you leaning more into, culture? or into the things of God, because they look completely opposite. 
Success doesn't look in the kingdom the way success looks in the world. And for those of us who are successful in our jobs, you have that so that you can be a light, not so you can just shine for you. God has opened that door so that his light can shine through you where you are. What, what, what is it? What's got us going? I thought about this when I'm asking you some quick politics. It's crazy. It is absolutely crazy how many Christians are losing their mind over this political thing. Don't send me an email about that either because it ain't red, white, and blue. It is just Jesus. So don't go there. We've just gone too far that the gospel isn't what's important now. Now we're lifting up other people and other things. What is it? Striving, tiring yourself out, fatigue, drain. So drain with your own rhythm of life, of what you think life should be. And I would guarantee you many of us are forfeiting the very pleasures of God in our lives that are right in front of us. It makes me think of a child that they have a cookie. You gave them a chocolate chip, but they're busy looking at the Oreo. Makes sense, huh? That's us. We got the chocolate chip, but I'm busy looking at the Oreo that I can't even taste the chocolate chip and don't even know what it tastes like because I got my eye on something else. We're forfeiting the simple pleasures. I want to talk, listen, my husband and I were talking about this this morning because it's all in, in our house. Um, we were talking, he said, Tara, do you remember when they used to say to us, hey, before you know it, and we were teenagers, before you know it, you better do this, you better live this, you better, you know, with God, before, because time is fleeting. It goes by so fast, before you know it, you're going to be 60. And we start laughing, we're like, man, we 60. It got here before we know it. And, I, and I, I say this to you because even with those of you who have children, that you're so busy that you can't enjoy them, that you got them stretched into 99 different things that they don't even know why they're going. They just go on. You're missing an opportunity to just spend time and get to know them. Before you know it, they'll be going to college. Before you know it, they're out of your house. I walked past Gila's daughter yesterday. The young adults meet on Tuesday night. And I walked past Gila's daughter and I, I looked at her. I said, oh, welcome, you're new? And I said, what's your name? And I looked up, I said, wait a minute. You're Michaela. Lord, I've known you since you were a child. Here's a full grown woman now. Before you know it, your children will be gone. What are you doing with those relationships? What's got you so distracted? that you're so busy striving and straining the gift that you're missing the gifts that's right in front of you. The preacher takes an assembly and he takes the time. And what Solomon does, as I wrap with this point, Solomon takes the time to be reflective and he shares some in-depth information with us, this wisest man that ever lived. Go back to Ecclesiastes. I just wanna look at verse 18 because this is what he speaks to us in verse 18. Verse 18, I want to read it again. He says, for in much wisdom is much grief, and he who increases in knowledge increases in sorrow. The wisest man who ever lived said, there was just much now, there's just much grief. I increased in knowledge, and it was just sorrow. The more I knew, because I was living apart from God. Satisfaction, no one can satisfy but God. That's what he is telling us. And he speaks to, while you're under the sun, so here he says, while you're under the sun, while you're on this earth, which is a demarcation of time when it says under the sun, while you're under the sun, ladies, listen to me. He's saying, hey, look, life is complex. It is messy. It is filled with ups and downs. You can go to the doctor tomorrow and get a doctor report that floors you, that knocks you to your knees. But he says, in the midst of it all, here's what I want you to understand. There can be joy. There can be exuberance. There can be a life with vigor and joy when it's connected to the all Almighty God, because you know he sees the big picture. And live in light of that. No matter what Solomon says to us, live in light of that very truth. In Mark chapter 8, I got to go there real quick. I'm going over. Mark chapter 8. Look, this is what some of us are going to need to do. Jesus sees a man. He is, he is the man at Bethsaida. In verse 22, when Jesus comes to Bethsaida, 
The people brought this blind man to him and they begged Jesus to do what? Touch him. So what did Jesus do? He took the blind man by the hand and he led him where? Out of town. When he had spit on his eyes and he put his hands on him, he asked the man, do you see anything? What did the man said? The man looked up and said, I see men like trees walking. First of all, let me just pause right there. The man says, I see men like trees walking. First of all, this gives us notation of the man had not been born blind because to know what trees look like, he's seen a tree before. How does this apply to us? The man's vision was clouded. He said, I see men like trees. And for some of us, our vision has gotten clouded to where we see life like a tree. We, it, it, we can't see life clearly anymore. We're, our vision is clouded. Our perspective is, is cloudy now. Our, our, the way of life is clouded to us. We've allowed maybe some of the things of life to just cloud our vision of the goodness of God. We've allowed some things to come into our vision. Maybe it's grief, maybe it's pain, maybe it's sorrow, maybe it's anger, maybe it's whatever it may be, but it has clouded our perspective on life in light of eternity of how we can live right now. Ask you a question, what's got your vision cloudy? What's got your vision cloudy? I had to ask myself this question because I realized that my vision was a little cloudy. And I said to someone, my vision got cloudy when I turned 60 because my mindset shifted to a 60 like, oh man, I haven't done this, I wanna do this, I wanna do that. And I allowed the tension of what the enemy was trying to put in my mind about life that I had to start saying to myself, until Jesus says it's over, I'm still here, press on. With all of the aches and pain, my knee is hurting now, that's why I'm sliding, but look, keep going. Keep going. <laughs> you got to keep going. It's going to be some hardships. It's going to be rough. But what's got your vision so cloudy right now? Because something isn't going your way. One of the young ladies said, my life just isn't where I thought it would be at 30. I'm like, girl, be quiet. You're 30. putting all that pressure on yourself to be married, to have kids by then. By the time you get them, you're going to be saying, I wish I had listened. Listen. <laughs> What's got your vision so cloudy that it's got you stuck, chained to a certain place in life? Look at what Jesus does, and this is what I'm asking him to do for us. Verse 25, then he put his hands on his eyes again and made him do what? Wait a minute, he made him do what? He made him do what? I want you to say it again. He made him do what? Say it like you really mean it. He made him do what? You need to look up. You and I need to look up to the hills from whence cometh our help. All of our help comes from the Lord. He made the man look up and he was restored and saw everyone how clearly you and I during this study, during these next seven weeks, let's start looking up. Let's start looking to, to the Lord, not, not looking to the ways of the world, not looking to the what was, knowing that we got this itinerary, that this is not our home. We have a reservation at a cemetery without the privilege of cancellation should the Lord delay his return. Listen, in light of that, let's start living backwards. Let's make some decisions and let's enjoy life. Let's enjoy what God has given us. Let's make some decisions that reflect the kingdom mindset. Let's make some decisions and choices that would align to the purpose and the will of God. What are your priorities? Where are you putting your hope? Let's start looking up. I want to read this very last thing in our book. Open your, your book to page 12, and then I'll pray. I love that the Lord touched the man again. He told him to look up. Lord, help us to look up. I pray when you see your children, you look up, and God gives you a different perspective of your children, that you look up and you see your marriage in a different way that you look up and see your job and instead of complaining about that job, saying, Lord, I thank you that I got a job to go and, and get, make some money. Let, help me to see this job differently. Give me a different perspective of the people around me in my cubicle that I want out of my cubicle. Help me, Lord, to love them. Yes, Lord. You're gonna have to open my eyes. You're gonna have to look up and see you. You can't quit that job. Because wherever the Lord plants us, we gotta learn to bloom. And we got to learn that this is about a kingdom perspective. It's kingdom. It's kingdom. 
He says this at the bottom of page 12. Ecclesiastes teaches us to live life backward. It encourages us to take the one thing in the future that is certain, our death, and work backward from that point into all the details and decisions and heartaches of our lives and to think about them from the perspective of the end. It is the destination that makes sense of the journey. If we know for sure where we are heading, then we can know for sure what we need to do before we get there. Ecclesiastes invites us to let the end scope our priorities and goals, our greatest ambitions and our strongest desires. And while that's for all of us, I keep praying this for our young people particularly because you're accepting so much pressure from the culture to measure up to what they say success is. He says, I want to persuade you that only if you prepare to die can you really learn to live. And as I was studying this, I wrote this. I felt the Holy Spirit spoke this to me. When I die, I'm going to see him, but he wants me to see him in my everyday living, my choices, my relationships, and my resources. That's what he wants for us. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this first night that we start out with how to live life backward. And it is truly a shift in our mindset in view of eternity. Most of us have just thought of eternity as we want to make sure that we're going to heaven and not hell. But that's not it. It's in light of eternity to live backward, knowing that eternity is sure, but reflecting our decisions, our choices, our ambitions, our goals. This absolutely frees us from striving. So I pray as we take this journey, we would open our hearts and our minds to allow your Holy Spirit to do a work on the inside. For some of us, it's, it's going to feel like a fish out of water. It's so uncomfortable. You're going to call us to some places that we haven't experienced before. We're going to want to run back to the familiar. But Lord, help us to stay the course by the power of your Spirit. Help us to stay the course. Where it's hard, where we got to shed some tears. Lord, you are with us in it. You're with us in that shedding of a tear. I believe you're going to bring some joy on the other side. Just help us to stay the journey, God. And as we're sitting around other ladies who will share their journeys, we're not here to fix it, but we're here to encourage them. Press on my sister. Press on my sister. It's not that you got great things. It's that you have a purpose and a plan. And if whatever the, you do, whatever you do, that makes it great. Whatever you do, it is good. Whatever you do, it is perfect. So God, as we share at our tables and we share our journey, we share from a place of authenticity and realness, from a place where of non-judgment, because none of us in here are counselors and none of us are the judge. You are the just judge. So we thank you, Lord. Thank you for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen.